I wasn't quite sure what to do. Sho said, just do something high level and inspiring, so I'll try. Let's start with a brief history of neural networks. So very early on, these gentlemen here, McCulloch and Pitts, described something called a perceptron, which was their math very simple mathematical model of how a neuron works. There's some inputs, you sum all the inputs together, and if they're above some threshold, then the neuron fires. So this is based on classic electrophysiology and our understanding of the biology of a neuron. And people got really excited about this in the late 50s and early 60s. And we're talking about, you know, walking, talking robots and neural nets that mimic the brain. And then this gentleman here, Marvin Minsky, who's a very famous computer scientist who also in his spare time invented the confocal microscope, uh, his PhD thesis showed that with a feed-forward perceptron network, which is what everyone was working on at the time, all it can ever do is learn linearly separable functions. That's it. So if you plot all your data, it can just learn to draw a line to the data. And people got very depressed. This fed into a whole bunch of other overpromises in other areas of AI, expert systems, uh, logic-based systems, planning systems. In the early 80s, DARPA and a bunch of other funding agencies poured a ton of money in and the AI community just didn't deliver, right? The, the grant proposal was, we're gonna build walking, talking robots that will fight the Soviet Union, and we didn't get anywhere near that, and this happened. So if the computer scientists in the room are smiling because they know about AI winter, and AI winter was a real thing. If you were an AI researcher in the late 80s, early 90s, it was very difficult to get funded, and amongst all the areas of AI, the least popular, most ridiculed was neural nets largely because of Minsky's influence. During that time, Canada's own NSERC was the hero. NSERC continued to fund Jeff Hinton and Joshua Bengio, so at U of T and UDM. Doing, they were like these crazy guys off in the corner doing neural networks research and you know, good, solid, honest scientists, but everyone knew it was nonsense and it really wasn't gonna go anywhere, but you know, it was worth exploring as a purely mathematical object, so we'll keep funding it. Uh, Jan LeCun on the, on the far end there, who's at Facebook now, was a researcher in the US and I remember being at a conference where people didn't want to eat lunch with him because they're like, if I'm seen eating lunch with Jan, people will think I'm crazy and I do neural networks research. So seriously, that, that's how toxic neural nets were. Um, and sir, continued to fund these two guys, and now Canada has kind of a first mover advantage in AI, which we're seeing with things like Vector Institute, what's going on in Montreal, and more recently DeepMind expanding from London, UK to Edmonton, Alberta. I was in Edmonton two weeks ago talking to a deputy minister there who was like, wow, they came to Edmonton? I was like, yes, that's what the whole world said. They came to Edmonton. And that's because of Rich Sutton, who's a reinforcement learning uh, researcher who was similarly supported. Everything you need to know about neural nets in 10 minutes. I've got 15 minutes left, actually 16. I'm gonna to try to give you a super high level overview. So there'll be a few equations and stuff on the slides, but we don't need to get into equations or anything. For anyone who's here, just kind of they want to get a taste of, of how deep learning works, we're gonna do that. So the idea is you have these systems that are connected. You have an input layer, and each one of those input circles is just gonna be a value, usually a floating point number. So you know, this is gonna be a vector of floating point numbers, 3.2, 4.5, 1.7, 1 whatever. If it's connected, then the value propagates down into this node. This node sums up over all its inputs, maybe applies a transformation, and then decides do I, what do I pass on to my next layer. All of that propagates through, and then you get a vector out the end. So vector in, some transformation, vector out. Critical realization here is that even though this graph looks very complex, it's actually just linear algebra, right? You've got some input vector x, you're multiplying it by a matrix that describes how these things are summed and connected, and maybe you have some offset value too, or offset vector. So this can all be done with linear algebra, and the critical thing about it all being done with linear algebra is it's really, really easy to do on GPUs, which are great at linear algebra, because that's what you need to do for 3D graphics for high-performance video games. And that just happened to be a happy coincidence, and that allows you to train on huge data sets. So all of a sudden, we have an enabling technology that makes it 
really fast to do streaming computations, uh, streaming linear algebra on floats, at the same time as everyone's starting to gather a whole bunch of data, and you've got exactly the right environment for a couple of theoretical breakthroughs out of Hinton's lab, and all of a sudden, everyone's very interested in neural networks again. Key thing in contemporary neural networks is, after we've done our linear algebra, we introduce a nonlinearity, some kind of squashing function. So it's typically sigmoidal. Those of you who are really aware of what's going on in deep learning will say, oh no, but everyone used rectified linear units now. That's true, except for the most recent papers at uh, ICLR, then you actually have to take a step back. But you introduce some kind of nonlinearity at the end of the network. So that network's a little bit of an oversimplification. At the end of each one of these, I want to introduce a nonlinearity, and that nonlinearity is what gives you power. That's the nuts and bolts of how a simple neural network works. But intuitively, what's going on? Well, Minsky's right. If we don't have any nonlinearities, and it's a feed-forward neural network, all it can do is encode a linearly separable function. If you've got two classes of things that you want to input, and you want me to, deter to distinguish between those two classes, they better be linearly separable. If I introduce nonlinearities, though, that allows the neural network to learn how to warp the data space. So if my input space looks like this, and I use a strictly linear feedforward neural network, there is no line I can draw through here to separate my two classes. If I introduce nonlinearities, the first thing the network can learn how to do is I'm going to morph the data space, and now they're linearly separable. And there's a very nice paper by uh, Lacun, Hinton, and Ben a couple years ago in Nature where they sort of walk through this from the intuitive standpoint. Highly recommend reading it if you haven't already want a good introduction. This is a very special type of neural network, and I want to talk about it because it's important, but it isn't obvious at first why. It's called an autoencoder. And the autoencoder is a neural network that learns the identity function. So if you put in 7, its answer should be 7. Of course, you're putting in a vector, and what you want to do is train the neural network to take a vector in and output exactly the same vector, which seems like a really you know, not very interesting thing to do. How many people here think they could program the identity function in a programming language themselves with a the neural network? Right. Hands and laughing. Good. So why would we want to do this? Well, because if I force the network to go through a bottleneck here in the middle, I say, okay, big vector in. I want you to reproduce the same vector, but I'm only going to let you have three neurons in the middle. The idea is that I'm going to force it to generalize. And there's all sorts of other things I can do. I can do denoising, I can do dropout, I can do sparsification, I can do stacking. You can look all these things up. Lots of papers on archive. But again, the key idea is I still want to learn the identity function, but I'm going to go through this bottleneck, so I'm going to force the thing to generalize about the data. It can't just memorize a lookup table. And this turns out to be extremely powerful. Why? Because it's really easy to train an autoencoder because you don't need labeled data, right? If I'm trying to do a classification task, I need my raw data. So if it's images, I need you know normal hearts, hearts in a disease state, and then I need someone to have classified each one of those manually. If I'm training an autoencoder, I don't. My input is an image of the heart, and my output is an image of the heart. And I'm hoping that somewhere here in the middle, it's actually learned an interesting decomposition of, of how we should break up features in heart images. And if you do that, then, so you train it on raw data with no labels, then I cut the top part of the autoencoder off, and I replace it with a single layer to do classification, so softmax layer, for example. And then I train this on my tiny little bit of labeled data. So this was one of the early tricks that Andrew Ng and, and that cohort uh, came up with. Train an autoencoder on unlabeled data, reserve your precious, expensive labeled data, and just use that to train the very highest level. The intuition is the bottom part of the network has learned de novo how to extract features, and then all I'm doing with my, uh, with my labeled data set is figuring out how to classify from those features. And that should be easier than just trying to classify on the whole image being input. Important side note, 
you don't get out a, a ternary classification here. You get out probabilities. So here's the probability it's class one, here's the probability it's class two and class three, which is nice because it allows you to assign certainties to things. From the point of view of most people, though, this is what a deep neural network looks like. Put something in, magic, and I get out a class that I assign it to, you know, the end. Uh, this is a dangerous way to work with neural networks. <laughs> but you, you still see a lot of papers like this. How do I train this magic network? How much time do I have? Good. Training the network. Let's go back to an autoencoder again because it makes training easy. My input and my output are the same thing. If it's not an autoencoder, then I've got some input and I've got some target output. So I put my input in. In our case, it's probably going to be an image. I put my image in, run it through the network, and it may have many more layers than this. I get an output vector, and then I compare that to the target and say, how different is this than what it should be? And then I come up with a cost function. So I've got a very simple cost function here, just essentially describing what's the distance between what the network came up with and what I wanted it to come up with. So I do that, and it's probably way off on my first try. So each one of these edges here is just a number in the matrix, right? that big W matrix, my weight parameters, how much weight this neuron carries on the activation of these neurons. So I just wiggle those weight parameters until this output gets close to the target. Wiggle, 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 that's it. How do I do that? With stochastic gradient descent. So there's a lot of partial derivatives here, right? This is a very complex space. This is assuming a three neuron, because it's easier for me to map, but you've probably got more than three neurons. So here's the cost landscape, and I probably start somewhere up here, and I just wiggle my parameters in a whole bunch of different directions and say, okay, well, that one looks like it's downhill, so I'll go that way, and then I wiggle the parameters again, and now that one looks downhill. So it's pretty much greedy search. It's stochastic gradient descent, so every once in a while you allow yourself to take a big step against the energy gradient. Imagine like Metropolis Monte Carlo kind of thing. And eventually you end up in a minimum. The fact that this works at all is absolutely amazing and one of the most interesting open questions in deep learning. If you're an applied deep learner, if you're an engineer, you're like, it works, good, done, checkbox. If you're a, a, a theoretical computer scientist like me, you're like, yeah, but why does it work? The best answer I can give you is the cost function landscape for most real problems, where I define real problems as problems people have published papers on archive about solving, has a lot of local minima, and the local minima are all roughly of the same order of magnitude. Why is that? That's a fundamental property of the questions we're asking, not of the technique we're using, and I don't know how to answer that. There's some early attempts to answer it using statistical physics and some sophisticated mathematics, but we're really just starting to probe why this is the case. This is the most amazing thing in all of deep learning. Okay. So that's how a neural network works. I want to tell you about three cool things, and it really is the tip of the iceberg. There's critically important areas like generative adversarial networks that I'm not even going to touch today. First one, because we're all here to talk about medical imaging and deep learning, you have to know about convolutional neural networks. And the idea is you take a normal neural network, and in addition to the layers where we do that normal neural activation propagation thing, I also add convolutional layers where I can take the input and apply a convolution to it. And I allow, using stochastic gradient descent, I allow my network to learn the kernels for those convolutions. So the kernels are not pre-specified. The kernels are learned. These networks get pretty... So this goes back to, you know, again, Jan LeCun was doing this in the late 90s, and people were like, that's never going to work. They're wrong. It does work. So you're learning relationships. You've got a high-level network here that may go out to classes, but lower down, you're learning convolutions, and you're also learning pooling functions, which allow you to sort of down, um, do um, down-resing of the image. And you can add other types of layers in there, and of course, there's lots of people who want tenure in deep learning who are throwing other different kinds of, of variables in there, but it's the convolutional layer that's critical. So you input your image, you do a convolution, you do a rectified linear unit neural layer, da, 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 da. there's a pooling layer, all the way up to, and then this final 
image here is no longer actually an image. We've gone from here's something that looks very much like an image, and after multiple layers of convolution and, uh, and neural computation, this is not really an image anymore. It's a semantic vector. So there's lots of analogs here to the human visual system, right? You're going from V1 all the way up to V5MT. I'm going from here's the low-level visual features, you know, lateral nucleus here, up to here's a semantic decision of what this is. So in the case of this image, it's a car. Might be a truck or an airplane, but it's, we're pretty sure it's a car. If we look at the lower levels, <clears throat> remember when I was talking about autoencoders, I said the whole point of the autoencoders, you're hoping that those middle layers are learning some interesting features. Here are the features that were learned by the lower levels of a convolutional network on the ImageNet data set. Do those look familiar? Gabor patches, right? I mean, this looks very familiar to anyone who's done psychophysics or you know, basic image processing. And these were not given a priori. These were learned. So that tells us something that these neural networks are learning features of the world that look similar to what our understanding of uh, human physiology tells us. Another cool thing you can do with deep neural networks is, uh, and convolutional networks in particular, is style transfer. So here's a photograph up here, and then you can take different paintings, and in this network you say, okay, take this photo and render it in the style of this painting, and you can see it does a really respectable job. Uh, there's a lot of artists who are you know, worried about this, but of course the good artists are saying, wow, opportunity, a new tool, right? And it's like being worried about the, the camera because you're a painter. This is, you know, things that were difficult are now easy, but that enables you to do new kinds of things. It's not perfect, though. Here is a set of images from ImageNet that are correctly identified as a school bus you know, uh, monument. Uh, and here is a carefully chosen adversarial set of noise. So we apply the noise to these images, and here's what they look like. To us, human visual system, they look exactly the same. But when you ask ImageNet to classify these now, the school bus is an ostrich, 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 ostrich. Every single one of these things gets classified as an ostrich. <laughs> so the message here is don't get too excited about deep learning. Convolutional neural networks are very powerful, and the analogy to the human visual system is really sexy. And there's people publishing papers about this and really gushing about it, but you've got to be awfully careful because it doesn't work exactly like the human visual system. The analogy is interesting, merits further, further investigation, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. You can add a little bit of noise in an adversarial, you know, adversarially chosen noise to completely mess up the classifications. So what we're learning here is these things almost look like magic until they fail, and then the failure modes are incredibly brittle, right? You know, I, I could show my seven-year-old any of these pictures, and even though she's only seven, she's not going to say, oh yeah, that's totally an ostrich, right? The, that failure is very, very unlikely. Second thing I want to show you is recurrent neural nets. I work a lot with sequences in my own research, so these ones are very important to me. What makes a recurrent neural network recurrent is that there are loops in the network. So instead of it all being feed forward, there are chances for information to flow back into the network. This makes training them much harder. Uh, they're, they're kind of unwieldy to work with, but if you're working with sequence data where you might need to memorize things, they're very important. And in addition to the loops, there's huge amounts of literature on all the different kinds of cool other things you can add in. These boil down to different types of memory. So you've got a recurrent neural network, and it's also got some memory units in it. So it can learn, to, that's an important feature for me to memorize, that one's not, so I'm going to pass on it. I took a very simple uh, character-based recurrent neural network, and I trained it on uh, 200 kilobytes of tweets from Amit because he's very active on Twitter. And here's what it generated. Now, it's not correct English, but what you have to remember, what that recurrent neural network is effectively doing is building a probability distribution at the character level. So if I see a C and then an A, here's the probability distribution that the next letter will be a T. It's building a model at that level. It doesn't know anything about the English language. It doesn't know about semantics. It doesn't know about syntax. And yet, we get a lot of words in here. You know, there, there's lots of at Western U. There's a lot that comes out here just from a probabilistic model at the character level. And you know, this was trained on my laptop in 15 minutes. 
So not very sophisticated. So there's a lot of power to analyzing language even at the character level. From an imaging standpoint, this is kind of a cool thing. You know, this classic CSI enhance. Yes, every image processing person hates that. But it's, it's kind of real now, but it's not really enhance. It's hallucinate. So here are some inputs into a recurrent neural network trained to fill in details on faces. Here's what it filled in. And then here's the ground truth, original image. And you can see it doesn't do a bad job of filling it in, but you wouldn't want to use this for this if this were crime scene identification, right? Oh no, that, that's definitely the guy who committed the crime based on those pixels. So it really isn't enhance, it's fill in. But there are lots of cases where you know, exact identity isn't critical where this might be useful. The last one I want to talk about before I, I uh, open the session formally is uh, reinforcement learning. So the big early famous win in reinforcement learning was DeepMind showed a, <clears throat> a network using deep queue learning that could play Atari games. And it could play a whole set of Atari games. And they had some nice videos of it learning to play the Atari games. And it ended up playing them really well. In the case of Breakout, it eventually learned that the strategy wasn't just try to get through. The strategy was to try to build a hole through and have it bounce back and forth. And then the, so yeah, it did quite well. There were other games where it completely failed. The idea of reinforcement learning is you create your, your deep neural network and it is an agent and an environment. It interacts with the environment. The environment gives it feedback. If it does something good in the environment, it gets a reward. If it does something bad, it gets a punishment. And then it works for, for reward. We've gone from Atari to being able to do a pretty good job of playing Doom in two years. The pace of research in deep learning is catastrophically fast, and in reinforcement learning, it's even faster. The most interesting reinforcement learning paper I've seen uh, this year was evolution of social cooperation. So they, in this case on the left here, they took two agents, and they had a very simple game of apple gathering. And the game of apple gathering was the agent had to move through a world and find apples and gather them. And the more apples you gathered, the higher your score. So that was your reinforcement. Each agent was also equipped with a laser beam, That's that little yellow beam going across there, that they could shoot at the other agent to freeze it. And what they found was that when apples aren't scarce, the agents just happily collect apples. When they're plentiful, they just run around collecting apples and ignore each other, and then as soon as the apples start to become scarce, the aggressiveness goes up and they start shooting their lasers at each other. Which, you know, it is intuitively sensible with what we know about human behavior, but it's interesting that you can do this experimentally, purely experimentally. This is sort of like experimental game theory on steroids. You can do things much more complex than Prisoner's Dilemma in this context. There was another game called Wolf Pack where each of the agents was a wolf and there was a prey animal and they got a bigger benefit capturing the prey animal if they cooperated. And depending on how you permuted uh, the, the different constraints in the environment, the behavior of the wolf agent changed. So this is really getting into computational social sciences here, computational uh, behavioral studies. AlphaGo is the big famous one. This is Lee Sedol who lost to AlphaGo. If you'd asked computer scientists five years ago, you know, chess was solved in the 90s, when's Go going to be solved? People would say, gee, we don't know. Because the search space for Go is so catastrophically huge versus the very tiny, comparatively, search space for chess. Not that it was brute force with Deep Blue. It was tr pruned, but it was effectively brute force. Giving up on brute force and moving to uh, deep reinforcement learning DeepMind was able to create, within a couple of years, a Go agent that, that beat the very best Go players in the world. So your mission, and what you're going to be talking about today, is to do the same thing to radiologists. Right? Least it all look, look, he looks pretty stressed here. Any radiologists in the room? OK, good. Oh. So here's how good AI is. I got this picture by typing depressed radiologist into Google image search. <laughs> and this is what came up. And, and of course, our, the, the point here isn't to replace radiologists. The point is to take away a lot of the drudgery of being a radiologist and leave the radiologist for the cases that really do require manual intervention, where, you know, where, where it's really difficult and tricky. And the reason why we're not going to have 
truly depressed radiologists anytime soon is ostriches, right? <laughs> If it happens that the CT scanner has a weird diffraction error the day that your CT is done and it happens to, to do this, you want to make sure that there's a human at the end of the pipeline checking the work. But there's a lot that goes on in radiology that could be automated. And I think you know, one of the reasons this particular workshop has so much interest is as medical imagers, you see the opportunity. And in terms of where deep learning is going to make the biggest impact in society the quickest, it's already been on imaging-related areas. And when you combine that with medical imaging and how important that is to, to society, you, know, you look at the cost of healthcare just in Ontario alone, and it's half the provincial budget, this is a big, big, important area. So all the best to you. Uh, I hope you get a lot out of this conference. Thank you for inviting me, Shil.